We must always remember that the purpose of study is at least in part the fact that we do not have all the answers. We are not attempting merely to communicate that which is already clearly known, but to search in the mystery and maze of the world's experience for things that are not too well known, in the hope of bringing clarification. And by clarification, we mean to bring forth out of ourselves additional resources with which to cope with the unknown. What we call growth, as far as knowledge is concerned, is the gradual conquest of mystery, in which by degrees we become sufficiently informed and sufficiently astute in our own contemplative faculties so that we can approach the unknown with organization and help, help to simplify and clarify various doubts that might previously exist. So when we begin to study uh, the planetary theology of ancient peoples, we are not in possession of all the facts that we would like uh, to have available. Two problems are presented by this situation. In the first place, we are not certain that ancient man was in a position to articulately clarify his own position. A great many of his findings were held intuitively by a kind of knowledge which does not base itself upon the strict processes of reason. In the second place, between antiquity and modern man is a waste of time, a tremendous desert of distances. We are no longer able to think as he thought, to understand what he understood, or to build our conclusions upon the reasonable causes of events which were sufficient to his needs. Thus, between the uncertainties of origins and the additional confusion caused by the destruction of ancient records and also by the loss of our true living knowledge of ancient languages, we must present certain reservations on this problem. But with this group of reservations, we have also certain evidence by means of which we may reasonably deduce or even induce that certain things were almost certainly true. And perhaps by contemplating the network of symbols, we shall begin to appreciate or apperceive uh, the principles behind the patterns which we can now contemplate. We must not assume that antiquity was all-knowing, nor must we assume that antiquity was all-ignorant. We must recognize that there are things we know that they could not have known. But there were also things which they knew internally, uh, which remain unknown to us because we are no longer naturally an internalizing people. They had certain interior illumination, which seems to have led them far in the search of essentials, whereas the outer light of our thinking has carried us vast distances into things not so essential. For instance, we begin our problem this evening with the problem or study of the seven deities, or as Plutarch refers <coughs> uh, to the mystery, the seven rayed God. Why was the seven so vastly significant a number in ancient times? How does it happen that this number coincides with what the ancients called consisting of five planets we know today and two luminaries? These seven bodies in peculiarly close relationship to the earth and appearing to move around it have for the longest period that we know been highly symbolical 
and highly significant in relation to theology. These seven wanderers, these seven planets, by the Egyptians, by the Persians, the Hindus, the Chinese, the Greeks, and many other peoples, particularly perhaps even the Babylonians, these seven planets were always identified with seven deities. These seven deities, in all these different groups, divided and organized themselves in practically the same patterns. And the powers of these deities, regardless of the names by which they were known, were identical. Thus the number seven comes to us with a tremendous and almost awe-inspiring pressure of validity. We know, for example, that there were seven principal deities among the Chinese. But their astronomy seems to have been a little better than ours of the ancient world. <coughs> For they had the five ancestral gods corresponding to the planets. And they also had two other deities corresponding to the sun and moon. You will remember uh, the time of the Annunciation of the birth of Confucius. Five old men entered in a vision, carrying or bleeding among them the Kirin, or Kiling, a magical animal, a kind of unicorn. And these five announced the coming of the great sage. At the time of this birth, it is said, these five old men were on the roof of the house in which he was born. Now the Chinese emperors, for at least 2,500 years, have celebrated the mystery of the five old men. And they were definitely and distinctly the planets. These same Chinese people also intimated two mystery gods that were concealed behind other symbols. Perhaps these mystery gods were the two planets that were later to be discovered. Uranus and Neptune concealed beneath the symbolism of the sun and moon, which served temporarily to complete the septenary. But we also know that in the Buddhist doctrine, there were seven primary Buddhistic powers. These seven are the great eternal bodhisattvas are never represented, however, in their fullness. We have only five like the five old men of China. We have the mention of seven Dhyana Buddhas, but we only have pictorial presentation of five, arranged in the form of a hollow square, with the fifth in the center. Now the Greeks had the same subterfuge of using five and two in a very strange combination. Philo Judaeus tells us the seven planetary gods were the vowels, <coughs> or the seven powers of sound. Is it not interesting, therefore, that we are still having trouble with our seven vowels? We only recognize five. And we have a funny old doggerel verse that uh, has been used in school for a long time. The vowels are A, E, I, O, and U, sometimes W and Y. We've never been able to quite arrange this W, Y situation. We have, however, the five vowels that we know. Researchers, even in so conservative field, conservative a field as Dr. Ryan, in his extrasensory perception research, follows the old belief that man has seven senses. But we can only find five. Again, two concealed. And we are told that these two concealed sensory perceptions relate to the extrasensory gamut or perceptions that are as yet in potential, but not yet in potency, in the life of the average human being. Thus we have a series of strange fives that fall short of seven. And this peculiar situation has continued, even into the study of sacraments, 
where certain sacraments were for the laity and certain only for the priesthood. Uh, the ancient Kabbalah says that originally Moses wrote seven books, of which five are the Pentateuch and the others are lost. The so-called sixth and seventh book of, Mo of Moses that you can buy in paper bindings in some bookstores, these, uh, this compound is a forgery, dating from the Middle Ages. But the five books of the law are said to have been only five-sevenths of the original revelation. So this five again appears. And wherever this five appears, it has been tied to the planetary mystery. Now if we wish to assume that the divine creative power was a septenary, let us consider for a moment what Pythagoras thought of the septenary. From the earliest studies of numerology, back in the classical period when folks really took it seriously, and uh, at the time when it was applied directly to certain classic alphabets, and this is important because in ancient times men paginated and numeralized by means of letters, which we no longer do. Therefore, pages were letters instead of numbered, and every letter had its numerical equivalent. On very, we do not have this in English. But according to Pythagoras, the number seven was the number of law. It was the number of the universe. It was the number of the gods and of the immutable principles which lie at the root of existence. Arrhenius tells us that one of the old Gnostic symbols of Christ showed the head of the Savior surrounded by a halo of seven rays, these rays assumedly representing the seven powers of the Messianic dispensation. We learn in the book of Revelation of seven churches which are in Asia. And these, of course, carry very closely to the seven chakras of the tantric Vedantic system in India. And the moment we go into the problem of the seven chakras, we come again into the five-seven difficulty. Because our systems in Asia break up, and some systems insisting that there are only five of these centers, and the other systems representing five developed out of seven and two in potential. So we come back to this strange number again. And this number constantly fights the struggle between the five planets and the seven members of the solar system anciently known and recognized. On another level then, let us go back to our Egyptian religion, where we learn that Ta, P-T-A-H, the potter of Memphis, the deity who fashioned the world upon a potter's wheel in the form of the egg of Seb, the great mother goose. By the way, a little tie up to our fairy story and our fairy stories and our mother goose legends. Because in several religions, the world was the, was created in the form of the egg of a mother goose. Rather curious. But folklore has stepped in and distorted these things almost beyond resemblance to the facts. But Ta, who fashioned the world egg, similar to the world egg of the Greeks, which broke into the golden and silver hemispheres and gave birth to Catherine Pollux. But this egg, fashioned on the potter's wheel, uh, was the work of the master builder, the master potter. And Ta was the lord, governor, and presiding genius over the seven Armonian artificers. And these Armonian artificers in Egypt were dwarfs. Mysterious little beings represented glyphically as gnome-like figures, each of which held in its hand a bare knife, held in this kind of a position, upright knife. These were the knives which the worlds were gouged out of space. And the uh, seven Armonian artificers are said to have come out of the earth near the site of the Great Pyramid. They were the ancient ones, the formators the fashioners of things. And there were therefore, among the Egyptians, beliefs about the seven creating powers or laws. In the ancient Kabbalah, the creating fiat or word was spoken in the form of the seven vowels, 
two of which, again, were mystery vowels or secret letters, which could not be known and for the deficiency of which the great name could not be restored, captured, or preserved. In the Jewish early works in Genesis, we find in the opening chapters the Elohim. And the Elohim are the seven creating powers of the great deity who is said to have fashioned the world in the opening chapters of Genesis. These are the spirits of God that moved upon the face of the deep. Their number was identical with that of the Armonian artificers of Egypt. They were the powers or creating attributes released by the speaking of the word of creation. And this word was always a word composed of vowels. So we go back to the mystery of the five dash seven vowels. All these points to all these things point to some kind of a doctrine, which frankly and obviously is very difficult to trace after so long a time, but it meant something and had a very clear and definite bearing upon the entire structure of the universal organization as it was known to the ancients. Pythagoras, in defining this mystery of the seven, goes on to relate it to the seven powers of universal generation. And in explaining this, he tells us, and Plato later corroborates him, that the, power, that the soul was a numerical mystery patterned in the geometry of seven. That the soul of man actually consisted of seven parts and an eighth sphere. Now this eighth sphere also arises in the ancient religious doctrine. The eighth sphere appears in the Gnosis and in the recent discovery of Gnostic books in Egypt probably the most important religious find in the modern world, far more important than the Dead Sea Scrolls. Found, these books, incidentally, were found earlier, slightly earlier than the Dead Sea Scrolls, but are not as well known. In this Gnostic collection, we have a very great deal of information bearing upon the esoteric use of numbers and of the various deities and principles that are represented by them. Pythagoras, who was perhaps one of the outstanding leaders of the study of number-letter relationship, pointed out that man in contemplation, energizing within himself but not speaking the vowels, that this energization moved into various relationships to himself, so that in, in thinking or internally sounding these vowels. He had the sense of their forming a pattern around him in space. Some of the vowels have to be thought or sounded above, others below, some before and others behind, some in the center. These vowels naturally by their sounds produce patterns that are of the greatest importance. In the Epistle uh, Sophia, in the Book of the Saviors, and the Gospel of Truth, the great Gnostic writings. We also learn of this eighth power, or eighth sphere, from above below. And this eighth sphere is called the abyss, or the dead world, or the world of darkness. And the eighth sphere is our planet, thus supplying to the ancient uh, a mystery, which in the Gnostic ritual is sometimes called the abortion. It is the abode of the fallen spirits. And it is also, as Pythagoras pointed out, the sphere of generation. So he bestowed upon the seven energies of the soul an eighth power, which he called the power of generation. The eighth power of the soul being that which precipitates it into body and creates its association with physical and material things. Thus the eighth planet and your Yezid of Iraq, uh, your various sects worshipping the diamond peacock, also know of the mystery of the eighth sphere. 
and we have intimations of it and hints of it in many places. We find it in uh, Christian religious symbolism where the virgin clothed with the sun and carrying the man-child in her arms is standing upon a globe. This globe is the eighth sphere which is beneath her feet, just exactly as it is presented in the Gnostic rituals. Now if you go back to Revelation for a moment, you will come to the seven lamps and the great figure that moves among them. And we know that in the tabernacle and temple rites of the old Jews, the seven-branched candlestick is the symbol of the seven planets. All this shows a tie. It shows this tie returning. I talked to some of the um, medicine priests among our southwestern Indians. To them, the planets also have peculiar meaning, although these Indians do not appear to be aware of any astrotheological symbolism such as we know. Still, these planets are superior beings. And why a light in the sky should so universally be so regarded, where it has no correspondence in human experience, can only tell us that either there was an ancient diffusion of this knowledge, or that man has intuitively developed it within his, within his own psychic nature. And it is possible that Pythagoras being correct, and that, the, that man possessing a soul, which is archetypally sevenfold in principle, that this sevenfold archetype forces man to contemplate everything outside of himself in terms of a septenary. He cannot escape the incessant demand of discovering seven around him because he moves from a point of seven within him. Such might uh, sustain some of our thinking. And so we proceed to some of the theological systems of devices by means of which this particular and peculiar pattern is revealed to us. The seven great gods have always played their <laughs> dominant role and each of these deities has had a common purpose or reason uh, for the symbolism that has arisen around him. A very good description and discussion of this will be found in Godfrey Higgins' great work, The Anacalypsis, which is probably one of the most exhaustive and, for most readers, exhausting study of the subject that can be discovered. But uh, Higgins, who has a monumental capacity for analogies, to every religion of the world, not only to discover uh, the septenaries, but also to discover the numerical equivalents of the names of deities, so that these in turn could be fitted into this essential septenary pattern. His attainments in this direction, or in these directions, uh, were outstanding. Do we have, in our experience, certain patterns on which we can build. What are the analogies that we really know or believe that we know? Let us begin with one of the luminaries that perhaps will offer itself for our early contemplation. The Egyptians declared that Isis represented or symbolized the lunar power. But this was not enough in itself, because in all these ancient peoples we can't exhaust their thinking with a single statement. Therefore, we have to go further. Isis representing the lunar energy from Esau, meaning ice, frozen, something held locked, crystallization. These terms might be applied to what we have often held to be the condition of things on the moon. But Isis, as the lunar mystery, represents the moon in the form of the generative impulse of the moon, the moon as mother, the moon as the source of fecundity, the lunar cycle, which is particularly preserved and was anciently religiously noted as being tied to the menstruation cycle, the cycle of fertility and of generation. 
Now the moon we know has two phases or qualities which are particularly noticeable. Namely that it increases and decreases in light. And that it is at sometimes full and at sometimes totally invisible. Also that it may appear as a crescent or as a partial sphere. So the Egyptians had two deities, the white and the black Hathor, to use in connection with the lunar phases. And the black and white Hathor governed or ruled the underworld. And the underworld, of course, now, for our thinking, is our eighth sphere or the earth. This is the underworld of Plato in which men come not of, uh, when, uh, go not when they die, but come when they are born. For this is the purgatorial, the underworld. Right here among us, as we are gradually coming to realize more clearly every day. <laughs> now, Isis has a sister, whose symbol is called Nephthys from which we have our word naphtha. Now Isis has always as her symbol the empty throne of the sun god. And Nephthys has as her symbol a bowl, a hollow bowl. The hollow bowl, of course, is a symbol of the earth. Because the earth is the receptacle of energies, according to the ancients. It is the mysterious cup which catches the wine of the Eucharist, or the wine of life. The earth is the sun grail, which contains within itself the sun grail real, or the blood of the king. It, the earth is the receptacle, just as the physical body of man is the receptacle of the principles which make him a living thing. So Nephthys, represents the earth or the lunar energy in its physical potential. So the moon and the earth are sisters. And if you go into the ancient astronomy, you will be able to suspect that this could well be true. And in your Indian, East Indian doctrines, the affinity between the moon and the earth is very close and might be regarded as a relationship, such as that between Isis and Nephthys. Now in the other systems we find other deities representing this. We have, for example, Diana, who is the uh, great lunar deity of the Ephesians and Etruscans and other Greeks. Her bow is the lunar crescent. She is the huntress. She is hunting for the deer and is often found or represented in ancient art throwing her javelin or firing her arrow into the flank of a stag. The deer, of course, is an earth-moon symbol and has always been so represented from the deers on the agrasal tree of Odin to the deer that pulls the uh, sleigh of Santa Claus. The deer has always been a symbol. It has been a symbol of imagination. It has been a symbol of the various processes over which the moon has dominion. The lunar goddess, then, plays many parts among many peoples. She is the huntress. She is the, genera the generator or generatrix of the world. She is the great mother. She is the mother of mysteries. She is the symbol of experience of the lunar ancestry, the things that came before the night into which a man turns at death and the night of time from which he was born. The night moon symbol is very, very prevalent among ancient people. We also have the Indian symbol of Maya, or illusion. And Maya, Mari, Marie, Maya, all of these things are water symbols. 
The proper name for pure water would be Virgin Mari. Maya is illusion, represented in India usually by the reflection of objects upon the surface of water. Mirage, caused by water in the atmosphere. As a water symbol, uh, the moon is the origin of life, because ancient people knew that life came out of the primordial slime. This slime was in the Greek and, and Chaldean mysteries referred to as elos, or mire, the primordial slime from which the monsters of Besaurus history, the Phoenician account of Genesis, these monsters came out of the primal slime. Elos is the root of the word Elium, and Elium was the original name of Troy, the city that was conquered by Ulysses. And the victory of Ulysses over Troy, the mystery of Helena, or Helen, over whom the Trojan War was fought, Helen is an ancient name for the moon. So we have astronomy playing its part all the way through these stories. And we find almost always your lunar symbol as representing an illusion of some nature which must be overcome. Also, illusion in the sense of primordial ignorance from which wisdom is born. Therefore, reality is the child of illusion. Reality is born of illusion. Man born into the world is born into a state of ignorance from which he must ascend or which he must transcend by his own wisdom, <laughs> skill, and understanding. Therefore, through the illusion of life, through the miseries and misfortunes of ignorance, through wrong action, man is gradually pressed on to the achievement of truth. Therefore, truth is forever born of illusion. And it is also the radiant light born of the mother darkness, the light that shines in the darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. So in other legends and in other peoples, we also find this story of the moon divinity. We have, for instance, uh, the interesting note that when Michelangelo made his magnificent heroic figure of Moses, he placed lunar horns upon the forehead of the great uh, lawgiver of Israel. No one knows why this occurred. But we do know that the ancient Jehovestic cult, which caused or leads to what is called uh, the root J in the Jewish uh, religious history, was originally a lunar volcano cult. Whereas the Eloistic cult, or the branch E of the ancient Jewish descent, was the cult of the artificers of Egypt and the Elohim or the builders. And these two were originally separate religions, but they were blended together. The horns upon the forehead of Moses remind us also of the horns upon the altars of the tabernacle, the horns upon the crown of Osiris, the horns upon the helmets of the Vikings and the ancient Nordic peoples. These horns are the lunar horns just as surely as the ancient Ark of Noah, or the Ark of Noah, is the horizontal or fallen lunar crescent capable of holding water in the ancient beliefs, what we call the wet moon. Many, many such parallels, but now let us pass to another group just to see what kind of trouble we can really get into. Let us take the character of Mercury. Now, the planet Mercury in astrology, which has come down from the inscription tablets of Sargon, and which has never changed greatly its meaning, either in Eastern or Western thinking, Mercury, to the old astrologers, was described as a neutral power. That Mercury served almost completely uh, according to the nature of the planet with which it made its first aspect. 
that the power of Mercury, like that of the Greek Hermes and the Latin deity Mercury, derived therefrom with some restrictions, was the messenger of the gods. The peculiar symbol of the mercurial message, or the messenger, was the power of the dog, the faithful dog star. And the uh, power of Mercury was associated with the faithful transmission of knowledge. And the ancients placed this symbol under the control or direction of Sirius, the dog star. The star of the faithful one. And it still occurs in some of our religious relig uh, rituals and so forth. And in the Koran, one of the animals that was permitted to enter heaven, was the faithful dog that went into the cave with the seven sleepers of Ephesus. Now the seven sleepers of Ephesus is another interesting legend relating to the seven and this recurrent number. In this case, the seven sleepers, the seven powers of the soul and the faithful dog, the body, all went to sleep together. In the study of Mercury, we also go into our hermetic analogy and we come upon the sovereign symbol of Mercury, which was the original Egyptian deity Thoth, T-H-O-T-H. -T -H. Thoth is actually the root of our word thought, and has to do with the principle of mind. Thoth was regarded as the author of the great body of sacred writings, more than 40,000 volumes. We are not to assume, of course, that these were the writings of one person, but the writings of one mind distributed among all living beings. Universal mind writes all things. The Thoth, or Toat, of the Egyptians later became the Thoth Hermes of the Osirian cycle, and this in turn the Hermes Trismegistus of the later hermetic teachings which arose in Alexandria at about the beginning of the Christian era. Thoth's symbol is a stylus and a writing tablet. He is the symbol of the faithful recorder of things. He is the one that receives the messages of the gods and faithfully preserves them for all time. He is therefore the symbol of the messenger. He arises as Merodach in another group of religions, Babylonian. He is also preserved to us under the form of Nebo, the deity from which the great kings of Assyria and Babylon, such as Nebo Belshazzar, derive their name. They base their names upon this deity Nebo. It is also interesting that when Moses died, he died on Mount Nebo. And Nebo was the Mercury of these people, also represented with the stylus and the writing tablet, and in the Babylonian cuneiform, described as the Lord of the Writing Table. The Lord of the Writing Table. And Moses died upon Nebo. And Moses himself is remembered particularly because of the two tables of the law. These analogies get dim in interpretation, but the roots of them are very important. In India, the planet Mercury is called Buddha. And this is another very interesting situation. Mercury is also associated with the day of Wednesday in the Nordic mysteries, associated with Odin or Wotan. And Votan again occurs among the Kichis of Central America as their ancient navigating deity. Mercury or Buddha is represented in one of the Indian Buddhistic paintings as seated in the midst of the planets acting as their messenger or servant. Buddha's power as Mercury therefore ties with the possibility of the philosophy of mind. And we know that Buddha, from the beginning of his ministry to the end, preached the danger 
of the wrong use of mental energy. Mercury in modern astrology is said to show the relationship between the mental energy of the individual and his ability to express himself through the sensory perceptions. Mercury, therefore, rules the five senses, which Buddha calls the five hindrances. Buddha was locked to the struggle to the death, practically, with the problem of those parts of man's constitution which are under the control of Mercury. Thus the religious symbolism and the philosophical symbolism tie together. The seven days of the week, of course, are another interesting example of the septenary. And in the septenary we have another curious point. If you go around the world following the sacred days, you will find that for one of the religions of the world, every one of the days is sacred. This is a good point, because it might remind us of the fact that, that all seven days are equally sacred in the first place, and that it is only our own limited virtue which forces us to <coughs> restrain our good deeds, particularly to one day, because we haven't enough of them to go around. <laughs> it's like, you know, Mother's Day or something. The only day we can really work up a lot of enthusiasm on the subject. The whole thought is wrong. Now, for instance, uh, in the Muslim faith, Friday is the sacred day. In the Jewish faith, Saturday. And in some of the early Christian faith, Saturday. Now, if we want to go back into the fight, we have to realize that we still have, in the Christian world, a tremendous struggle going on as to whether Saturday or Sunday is the correct day of worship. The other five days, we're sure of them. Here we have five out of seven again. And two, that we can't be quite certain as to what they should represent. But Venus is the uh, ruler of Islam. And the crescent of Islam is not the crescent of the moon, it is the crescent of Venus. And as far back as 2,500 years ago, the observers in the valley of the Euphrates had discovered that Venus is never visible to us as a circle. It is only visible as a small moon. Never full, but attaining maybe two-thirds or three-quarters of its fullness, but never complete, and usually visible only as a crescent. So the crescent of Islam is the crescent of Venus, as is indicated by the fifth day of worship, and also by the color green, which is the sacred color of Islam, which is precisely the color which was assigned by the ancients to Venus. So each religion, seemingly, breaks down upon this pattern, here we have Friday, the religion of Venus. Saturday, uh, the religion, uh, Friday, the religion of Islam. Saturday, the religion of Israel. Sunday, the religion of Christianity. And if we study carefully and go back through the records, which is quite an imposing task, but it can be done, I have gone through it. We find every one of these days was essentially related to one of the great planetary mysteries. Now, you have seen, perhaps, or at least have read in the paper, the story of the seven wonders of the world. I'm sure if you saw the picture, you are as completely uninformed on them as you were before. <laughs> it's a nice idea, but it does not quite gel. Uh, too much economy in the wrong places. But anyway, we do know there were seven wonders. And we do know that these seven wonders, whether anyone recognized it or not, were the seven wonders of the seven planets. Now let's just see how that worked out. We'll consider the wonders of the world. Remember now the key words of the seven planets in astrology. Saturn, the ancient symbol of death. Among the wonders of the world, the mausoleum of Halicarnassus, the great tomb, built in memory of the dead. The next one, Jupiter in the planets. The Olympian Zeus, one of the seven wonders of the world. The next one, Mars, fire. The Pharos of Alexandria, the great lighthouse. The fourth one, the sun, Helios, the Colossus of Rhodes, the great figure of the sun god that stood over the gates of the city or the harbor of Rhodes. Venus, the Hanging Gardens of Semiramis, Queen of Babylon. 
Mercury, uh, the great pyramid of Giza, sacred to Thoth Hermes, the master of the mysteries, and the moon, the temple of Diana of Ephesus. These were the seven wonders of the world, Diana, a moon goddess. So every one of the seven wonders, built by different peoples at different times, were by some strange circumstance dedicated to a different deity, never overlapping, and these seven correspond exactly with the planet. And uh, there can be no question that somewhere underneath that there was an intent or design of some kind. Again, your septenary, and of those great remains, those great monuments of antiquity, only one remains, the great pyramid of Giza. The others have vanished in the waste of time. We know their places by legend only. We believe that part of the old ruins of the hanging gardens of Babylonia may exist, but we are not certain. So here again we have what were called the pentacles, or the magical devices of the great creative septenary. And it would seem to me that developing of this idea might have been very interesting in connection with this motion picture that I mentioned, because it would show an ancient knowledge of astronomy and would also have revealed the mysterious fact that these various nations and peoples of different beliefs and of no great friendliness among themselves had all united to adore the seven powers of the soul and each had chosen a different one. And each had chosen the one that was wrote related to his own religion, showing that at that time there were seven of these groups, each worshipping one of the seven planets, powerful enough to undertake and complete the enterprise referred to under the story of the wonder, which one of the seven wonders it may be. So here is another case where these planetary symbols have moved in on us. And we can keep on going, and we can find them in Polynesia, we find them among the Eskimos, we find them everywhere. And out of these symbols, we come by degrees, as in the case of Mercury, to the realization that we are dealing with basic or symbolic principles, that there is a relation between the sensory perceptions of man, the races of man, the continental diffusion of human culture, the species and the types, genera of living things, all of which are capable of septenary division, the different philosophies and schools of ethics, morality, all of these great structures fit together to form one basic concept. Now, in your ancient Greek music, you had the same problem. You had seven musical modes. You had the seven strings upon the Orphic lyre. You had uh, the seven basic forms of Chinese music. And you had the septenary restated in the ragas of India, particularly in playing upon the great instrument, the veena, which is the sacred instrument of the goddess of music, of wisdom, and of harmony, the deity is Sarasvati. Always the same number. The Chinese name the strings of their musical instrument after the planets. If, therefore, this number continues and falls along, as we have suggested, we cannot question that the ancients held these points to be valid, that this analogy was real and purposeful to them, returning to the seven styles of architecture, the seven liberal arts and sciences, the seven sacraments, the cardinal virtues and the deadly sins, the seals of revelation, the trumpets that sounded, the lamps upon the altar, and all these mysteries, always identical in principle. Now let us uh, take another one of our groups of symbols and see what we can do with the deity Osiris. Osiris, we are told, rules the underworld. 
You all know, we've read, written about it and talked about it many times, the, the legend of Isis and Osiris, as it is contained in the account by Plutarch, one of the best and one of the earliest authorities that we have. We know that after his cruel martyrdom, Osiris descended into the underworld to become the lord of the quick and the dead. We know that his throne was set up in a mentet, the subterranean world. And here, with the uh, tendance of his sister wife, Isis, and her sister, Nephthys, he became the judge in the great weighing of the soul. Plutarch tells us that Osiris is the subterranean sun, that he is therefore the light that shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. This light which shines in the darkness is the night sun of Apuleius, who saw it blazing beneath his feet when he entered the sanctuary of Prosephone. Paracelsus tells us that there are three suns in the solar system, that every solar system has actually three sun structures or solar structures in it, as represented by the trimuta of the Hindu. That there is the spiritual sun, which is in the true center. That there is the psychic sun, which is in the northern uh, focal point of the ellipse, and there is the material sun, which is in the southern focal point, <coughs> and the, mor the mental or psychical and the physical sun, called by the Persians and Hindus, Asura and Asura, the true light and the false light, Ormuz and Ariman, the good angel and the fallen angel. These are the two suns which fight for control over the human soul. They must ultimately be reconciled in the true radiance of the spiritual sun, Aramanta. So we have the three sun mystery. And the terrestrial or subterranean sun is the physical sun that we see in the sky. Because it is that phase of the solar mystery which is concerned with manifestation of material life. Thus, this is the infernal sun, or the lower dark sun, that we see and which we regard as supernally brilliant. But this is the sun which feeds only body. But concealed behind it is the psychic sun which feeds souls, and ultimately the spiritual sun which feeds all things. This story is again contained for us in the transfiguration of Jesus. And the statement, of course, is preserved in the Bible, where, he, where it is said, My tabernacle is in the sun. This mystery of the sun and the solar rite comes down to us in the Osiris cycle. For Osiris is the light of the underworld. And in man, this light of the underworld corresponds to the solar energy within himself, with his heart, and with the life principle, uh, as it is physically disseminated through his constitution. Now, in man himself, there are seven organs, seven vital organs, which the ancients associated with the seven planets. The heart, which is the center and the archetype of the body, is called in Buddhism the Septapana Cavern, or the cave of the seven rooms, or parts. For the ancients recognized seven structures, consisting of oracles and ventricles, and related parts. And of course, the oracle in the heart is also the oracle of Delphi. For it was from the heart that the great oracular manifestations were revealed. As the man thinketh in his heart, so is he. The heart is therefore the oracle, placed in the center of man's earth. 
which is, of course, the omphalic stone at Delphi. In this uh, mystery also, the Hindus tell us that there are seven parts of the brain. And, and uh, Albertus Magnus gives us also the septenary division. But the seven planets are posited again in the brain as their polar positive extremity. And that also, as the earliest researchers indicated, there are seven sections of the human eye and that every part of the body is septenary. We know that there are seven important ductless glands forming the endocrine chain, which still represents the most mysterious structure of the body. And I was talking to a doctor not more than three months ago, and he said, yes, we still think in terms of the seven ductless glands, although we have a tendency to gloss over it, for the reason that we understand five and know nothing of the other two. We have the same problem again coming up. The pituitary and pineal, while we may not say we know nothing about them, we do know something, but we do not know enough about them. We know a considerable amount now about the pituitary. But the Sabbath gland, the seventh, the gland of the, the arc of the entire, the arch of the entire system, the keystone, is still an almost impenetrable mystery. This seventh, by the way, is in the, is the eye, the mysterious, uh, internal or all-seeing eye of the mysteries, which is again the symbol of Osiris, as worn upon the throne crown of Neptus, uh, no, pardon me, of Isis. So these problems come back in great mystery to us. But Osiris, as a subterranean sun, his body filled with eyes and plumed with the crowns of the north and south, or the extremities of existence, is part of a great solar cycle mystery. And his relationship to Typhon and the destroyer is not difficult for us to restore if we think a little. Quetzalcoatl, the feathered serpent deity of the Mayas, is another Mercury god, or another Hermes. And under the heading of Hermes, we have practically all the messengers of the gods. Now let's give a little thought to our old friend Jupiter. Jupiter, or Zeus. One of our problems today is that we are almost totally ignorant of the most interesting mythology that we come in contact with, and that is the Greek. With the exception of those mystifying and hopelessly inadequate fables, so lovingly preserved for us by Bullfinch, we have almost no knowledge of Greek theology. We have some fables and legends of Jupiter riding around in space in his chariot, or changing himself into a bull, and carrying away Europa. These things are comparatively meaningless as we are now given them. But that they are meaningful must have been true. Otherwise, they could not have held the admiration and respect of a people. Therefore, when we think about Jupiter or Zeus, we have very little understanding of the development of the great theological system to which this deity belongs. We do not, for instance, realize that under the name or form of Jupiter uh, is perpetuated the third person of the great creative triad of the classic Greeks, this triad consisted of Uranus, Cronus, and Zeus. And Zeus, being the third deity, was also the third form of the sun. In other words, the subterranean sun. Jupiter is, therefore, the creative power of the material world, the Demiurgus or artificer, the builder of the material world of things. 
Zeus is divided into two other deities. Zeus Poseidon and Zeus Hades. Both Poseidon and Hades, the water and underworld deities, are aspects of Zeus, or belong to his order. Therefore, the Greeks tell us there was a celestial Zeus, the one sitting in the heaven with the thunderbolt. There was an aqueous or terrestrial Zeus, Poseidon, lord of the seas. And there was an infernal Zeus, Hades, keeper of the underworld. And these three were the aspects of the mundane creating power. And these three aspects give us the three objective worlds in which we exist. Zeus, therefore, in man psychologically corresponds in many ways to the rational ego. Uh, Zeus can be compared to the mind united to the ego principle and therefore becoming the ruler of man's underworld, or the personality. Zeus is the archetypal legislator of personality, ruling the world from the personality downward, and constituting, therefore, in his three aspects, the mental, emotional, and physical attributes of man. Also, these attributes as we find them in the universe man being only a miniature archetypal pattern of something greater, or a miniature of a greater archetypal pattern. If we begin to study these points, we shall see that our astral theology forms a series of keywords, or keys, by means of which, through simple symbols, we can arrange all the patterns and designs of the creative processes of life. Now, if we go back to the early legends, for example, we discover that Zeus, representing uh, the third created power, the power of the material world, was required or forced to overcome the titanic forces. Now, in Greek mythology, there was a group called the Titans. And the Titans are the ones who stole Dionysus, or Zagros, the son of Zeus, took him out into the fields of space, killed him, boiled his body, and ate the flesh. And when this occurred, Zeus, becoming aware of the smell of the fire in which they were cooking the body of his son, turned his attention in one eye which, like the eye of Odin, was the eye that saw all, turned this eye upon the titans in chaos, perceived their crime, and launched his thunderbolt upon them, in which he destroyed the twelve primordial forces. He then took the ashes of these forces, containing within the, these ashes uh, the burned blood of his own son, and from these ashes form the bodies of mankind. Therefore, man contained within himself the twelve titanic principles and the blood of Bacchus, the blood of the atonement. For the wine of the Eucharist is the blood of Bacchus Dionysus, the god of the vine, represented usually bearing the vine or grape wound staff surmounted by the pine cone, which of course was the symbol of the endocrine chain, with the pineal or pine cone gland at the upper end. Dionysus, therefore, becomes the blood of the God in man, and the sacraments and ceremonies relating to this are part of the Greek mystery of the Eucharist. Now, in this situation, the Titans, astrologically and astrotheologically, represent the primordial power of the twelve constellations. They were the Titans. They represented the great field of space in which a solar system is to be fashioned. The Titans 
luring Dionysus out into the mystery of space, slew and devoured him. For the power of the constellations devoured uh, the light of the sun god, the pro progeny, the projected sun power. The solar mystery then slew with its rays, the thunderbolts, the titanic power, and fashioned from the constellations the body of man. And we have what? The little cut up man on the almanac front, with a fish under each foot, and a lamb over his head, and a twin on each arm, and a crab on his chest, really a most disfigured creature, but still highly symbolical. This was the old-fashioned zodiacal being, whose body was composed of the zodiac, and whose soul is derived from the blood of Dionysus, the only begotten of the creating power. We have another group of symbols rising in the legend of Castor and Pollux. We are told, for instance, in the primordial Greek myth as to be preserved for us in the Theogony of Hesiod, the great creating or creation myth, which uh, almost everyone interested in these subjects should read Hesiod. We are told that in the beginning there was the eternal power, the eternal being, undimensioned, unlimited, and that Within this power were two root principles, the Pythagorean duality in unity. And these two powers were called ether and chaos. Ether was of the nature of love, and chaos was of the nature of place, unorganized. The motion of ether upon chaos, or of love upon place, caused ether, which was eros, the principle of love, or life, or energy. Moving upon the mystery of space caused the whirling of space. Here we have the same principle with the Nordic mystery of the frost giants and the fire giants on the edges of the great cliff of the Nungaga, <coughs> and throwing their flames and hoarfrost into the abyss. They united and fashioned out of fire and frost the whirling form of Ema, the primordial place giant. In the Greek system, the struggle of ether against chaos caused motion. This motion ultimately became a great cyclic motion or a curved continuum, the turning upon itself formed ultimately the great field of the world egg. In due course of time, the world egg burst open. But perhaps before we get to this, which is a very dramatic episode, we can leave you in suspense for a moment as to what is going to happen, and mention something else about the egg, which I think is very interesting. Namely that this egg was divided into a northern and southern hemisphere, of which the northern was gold and the southern was silver. Remember the use of the egg symbolically and the colored Easter eggs by the Druids and the still the use of the sacred egg at Easter by the Greek Orthodox Church in which the presiding priest gives each member of the congregation an egg as the symbol of the resurrection. Now this is an interesting thing because the use of the egg symbol goes back to the serpent egg of Britain and the Druids and many other mysteries. But anyway, we have restored the idea now that our egg had a gold and silver hemisphere. In due course, this egg burst open and there came forth out of the egg Phanes, the great principle of objective existence. And Phanes was a deity with five heads. And these heads resemble those of the cherub of Ezekiel, except that there was an extra head. This is not so different from the mystery of the Vedas in India, because when the light of the Vedas burst upon the world, the Vedas were said to have possessed. Now the Vedas, remember, are the Hindu law. 
and we are acquainted with four Vedas. Now, according to the ancient Hindus, the four Vedas form the heads of the law. But no matter when you look at these four heads, there is always a fifth head in the back that you can't see. So actually, the Vedas consisted of five works, all of which are known, the fifth being called the Black Veda, or the hidden one. Now, the fifth head of Thanes is also hidden. But it is, it exists. And the five Vedas and the five books of the Mosaic Law are both Pentateuchs, or five-fold books. And Thanes represents the five powers of the true planets out of the seven which we have previously mentioned. Now Thanes, bursting forth out of the egg, became the Cosmocropor, the blazing forth the primordial form of the universe itself. The five heads are again the five Dhyana Buddhas, which blaze forth out of Adi Buddha, the supreme basic consciousness of the world. In the case of Phanes, from this power, or from Phanes, in turn, was born Uranus, the lord of the sky. And the two hemispheres of the egg, which had been broken apart, formed the superior and the inferior worlds. And it is said in the Old Testament also that that which was, though the waters which were above the heavens were divided from the waters which were beneath the heavens, or the firmaments. And the upper half was the heavenly world, and the lower half was the natural world. And out of the cleavage of these two, Phanes, or the power of creative vitality, the objective archetype, was released. Phanes became the father or creating principle of many, that is, of multitude, or of legion, the formation of living things. And they all took their archetypes from his five heads, these represented, therefore, five streams of life, which many people still uh, represent today as the five elements of ancient alchemy, earth, fire, air, water, and azar, and the five kingdoms which we represent, or were represented in the Greeks, the mineral, plant, animal, human, and heroic, the fifth being the power of the of ether or the energy of the soul, Akasha. In the, the development of these legends, therefore, we have the use of elements, we have the use of signs. Four of the heads of Phanes represent the fixed signs of the zodiac, which in turn become the great cross of the fixed signs upon which the sun is crucified. They become the great seasons, and the four seasons marked by the equinoxes and solstices are the seasons of the four great sacred ceremonies distributed throughout all humanity. If then we are to assume that these things simply arose from accident, that somebody sitting down tried to figure this out, where would we get? It is, first of all, absolutely necessary for us to assume that many peoples at different times, or at the same time, but greatly separated by cultures, by interests, by attitudes, by distances, came to the same conclusions, or received a similar indoctrination, and were equally impressed therewith, itself almost miraculous, that all people should have agreed in accepting this, even had a great missionary system carried the news is almost incredible, because it would have meant to uproot earlier doctrines that these people already possessed. But what were the nature of these earlier doctrines as far as we can find them? In China, the earlier doctrines behind the rise of the great system of the kings, and I don't mean rulers, I mean the books, the kings, like the Shu King, the Tao Te King, these great books, which began from the reign of the Emperor Fu Yi 
the earliest historic emperor. We know from the legends of China that prior to this, the Chinese people venerated the stars and built their great system upon the stars. We know that when Mohammed entered Mecca and overthrew the idolatry that was there, he was attacking the ancient religion of the Near East, particularly of Arabia, Persia, and uh, what we now call the Eastern Mediterranean. And this religion was Sabianism, the worship of the stars. We know that the earliest faiths that we have of Egypt indicate that they were preceded by an astronomical cult. We know this was true in the valley of the Euphrates. In other words, all of our religions as we know them rose among people who had previously worshipped nature, the heavens, the earth, the seasons, and similar sidereal phenomena. When the great Arya migrations in India moved down from the Trans-Himalayan area across the Indo-Gangetic plain to occupy India as we know it today, they moved in upon the Dravidian culture which already existed there. And Max Muller says the Dravids worshipped elements, planets, and stars. So Indian culture, as we know it, arose in an environment previously controlled by star worship. How does this happen? Where was this star worship? These people were not astronomers as we know them. They did not have the equipment. They could not have known the universe as we know it today. Yet their background was the worship of heavenly bodies, elements, and things of that nature. Several groups of researchers have tried to solve the basic mystery that this presents. And we always come back to the same inevitable. Namely, that the impression of these patterns arises from the constitution of the human being himself. Therefore, within the psychic field of man, as Paracelsus so broadly hints, there must be a concept according to the number twelve the mysterious dodecahedron, or twelve-faced symmetrical solid, which to Pythagoras was the symbol of the universe. This has to exist as an archetypal energy symbol within the human being, the ultimate recognition that all things that happen, happen within twelve, or within a twelve-fold diffusion of potential. And that this twelve-fold diffusion of potential, the eternal space has as its symbol, space equals twelve. Now, how it equals twelve, our own intuitive nature may not tell us. But when man thinks space, or man experiences space, he receives the instinctive impulse of twelve. Twelve, therefore, is the absolute symbol of potential in number, and was so accepted by the Pythagoreans. Potential is that which rests forever in abscondita, or within itself, a invisible, unknown, unchanging, and space, eternity, being, unconditioned, must archetypal, psychological, be signified by twelve. The motion of potential, uh, potential into potency, the emergence of things, causes the twelve powers to burst forth into the form of a septenary. And one of the greatest mysteries of ancient Hindu mathematics was the possibility of dividing the seven creative gods equally into the twelve creative powers without a remainder. And that was a fine mathematical problem, and it was solved. It is possible that seven can be distributed evenly through twelve, and at the same time, neither the twelve nor the seven fractionalized in any way. This was one of the old calculations of the Hindus, 
I've seen the calculation made. It can be done. But by this means, therefore, twelve eternally moving into seven causes a septenary, no two parts of which are the same. Therefore, no one of the septenary contains the same relations of the twelve elements, nor all of them. Thus we have seven basic potencies, or powers, which are the objectifications of the twelve potentials. And this moving from the state of twelve in suspension to seven in projection constitutes creation. Creation, therefore, emerges as a septenary. Now, the septenary in this case is mysterious for two reasons. And in order to understand this mystery, we must again go back to our ancient peoples. We know that they recognized five elements. And we know also that they recognized man as consisting of five parts, yet they always call him a septenary. And in order to create the septenary in the personality of man, it was necessary for the Hindu to divide the emotional nature of man into two parts and the mental nature, giving a septenary involving two forms of mind, higher and lower, and two forms of emotion, constructive and destructive. But this was not the original intention. This was again the blind, or the subterfuge. In the creation of a solar system, according to the ancient Hindu astronomers, each of the planets has five bodies. And they share together the sixth and seventh bodies of the sun. Therefore, the sun, as a field of energy, surrounds the planets. And the sixth and seventh body of each planet is part of the solar body. So there are five distinguishable planetary bodies. And the sun then has its own two indivisible natures or qualities which permeate the other five, forming again this mystery of the five and two. Uh, because the sixth and seventh bodies of planets are not individualized, but are within the sixth and seventh orbits of the solar mystery, or in the womb of the sun. They are not born. Only suns are born. Planets are embryos. Therefore, no form of life on a planet uh, can transcend five the levels of development without moving from a planetary to a solar focus. Thus, the sixth and seventh uh, Buddha to come are secret. The sixth and seventh senses are secret. The sixth and seventh vowels are uncertain. All is the same symbolism. And in this, the ancient Jews, the sun and moon, as the parents of the world, the marriage of the sun and moon producing man, as symbols of these sixth and seventh bodies, which later uh, will be clarified through uh, the release of these perceptions after man attains the sixth and seventh level of consciousness within himself. But the fact that man must accomplish this by universalizing his own nature is indicated in Buddhism, Hinduism, even in Christianity, for universal consciousness, cosmic consciousness, uh, true development of illumination, or the complete perfection of the mystical experience, moves at the means that the consciousness of man moves from the five planetary levels which can be reached for the senses to the sixth and seventh which belong to the sun. For the sun is the messiah and the mystery center of the solar system, and the sixth and seventh degrees of consciousness have to transcend matter, whereas the other five are within the power of matter. So these calculations were made long ago. We wonder sometimes how they were made, but they were. And they have 
survive to influence every thought we have had since. Now some will say, and perhaps with a measure of sense of uh, justification, Therefore, that when we explain all of this, we are only going to explain the way man thought in the first place. And we still have no way of knowing whether it's true or not. That even if man had all these conceptions, are these conceptions valid? I think the answer to that lies again in our effort to understand how these conceptions came into existence. What is validity? Is validity to be based merely upon a physical scientific approach to a subject which cannot be so approached and for which we have no instrument of any kind. The moment we transcend the phenomenal experience of living, we are out of the sphere of science. We can go far off into space and hunt for the orbits of other planets, but we are still on the level we are not escaping from the five zones which belong to planetary consciousness. To escape from those zones, something has to happen inside of us. We have to find the mysterious door in heaven, which John found, and proceed out of the sphere of effects into the consciousness of causes. This is your sixth and seventh mystery. And in the human being, the sixth and seventh part of his own energy field he shares with all other human beings. That is why it is possible for man to attain not only brotherhood but identity. This brotherhood cannot be attained on the lower levels. But if man has a certain experience of consciousness, he can become unified with all others of his kind. Because in every species, the sixth and seventh part of the septenary constitution is shared by the entire species. Thus we all move from individuality to universality as we ascend. Man seeking for these integrities, for these values, can therefore only find them by the personal experience of these causes. So this brings us to another interesting group of analogies. The ancients believed that when the law the Torah or the Veda or whatever you want to call it, was placed into the hands of the great messianic teachers of which seven are of particular interest and integrity as the founders of the great religions of the world. That these powers not only fashion the bodies and structures of these religions but as one of the old Rosicrucian adepts symbolized in an ancient work that he did. He represented this mystery by an interlaced uh, by two interlaced triangles in the form of a six-pointed star with a dot in the center. In each case, he placed one of the planets in the center and the other six in the circumference points. And changing the center one each time, he found that with seven, he could bring all of the planets once to the center, and then he would have a circumference, and in no two cases would the circumference be exactly the same, because a different one would be in the center. This, he said, was the ancient arrangement or order of the astro-mystical theology of the ancient religious systems. In antiquity, they did not have religions as we know them today divided into four or five great name groups. Religion in those ancient times consisted in the veneration of certain deities. And many peoples, not even speaking the same languages or knowing each other at all, worshipped the same deities. But altogether, there were approximately seven of these major religious motions. Each of these religious motions, like the seven wonders of the world, had a different core point. It was moving on a different member of this septenary body. I was mentioning this but long ago when someone pointed out, but Life magazine says there are not seven or eight religions, there were only five. And they gave five. What about the other two? 
Well, that's an interesting point. There were more. But again, the sixth and seventh religious power has not been given strictly to religions. It has been given to all of them in common. There are two powers which they share in common. In the development, however, of a simple symbolic septenary of planets, we do have what appear to be seven, but two are luminaries in disguise. In the development of the old system, these religions each served one of these deities in a peculiar way. And each of these deities represented one of the basic aspects of consciousness. The religions, therefore, actually formed, as in the legend of Jacob's ladder, a ladder of values. For each religion was like a chakra in the great Kundali system of the meditating deity who fashioned the world. Religions like races were specializations of the soul powers of man, and these specializations were septenarial so that there were seven great houses of God with certain esoteric disciplines and rites and symbols and allegories and legends peculiar to them. And these religions arose within racial structure and within national distribution. The whole thing was mathematically fitted together. Frank Higgins, a Masonic writer working about 30, 35 years ago, took the globe of the planet and he began to study this problem of the six-pointed star with a dot in the center. And he placed this star within the interior of a globe with the upper and lower points coinciding with the poles. He then whirled this star, so to say, within this globe, causing the other four points of the six-pointed star to make lines around the globe <coughs> at the points where they actually touched the surface, the inner surface of the globe. And he considered these points degrees of latitude. <coughs> He then went on and continued his studies by dropping lines from various parts of the earth to the core and to the opposite side, always keeping the original form of the six-pointed star. As a result of that, he came up with a very interesting discovery, that the great religious centers of the world all fall geographically almost exactly on the spots indicated by this division and this placing of the six-pointed star within the globe. In other words, if you drop a line uh, from one of the great centers, like the Great Pyramid, right straight through the earth, you go through another center, world famous as a religious institution. You go through these systems, and he made a very careful study of it and came to some extraordinary conclusions that the entire distribution of man's worship has been mathematically correct in terms of the earth on which he lived, which is not remarkable when we realize that whoever built the pyramid not less than 4,000 years B.C. was able to orient that building at that time to the 11th decimal point. We could hardly do it today without a great deal of calculation. Anyone who could do that must have had a profound knowledge of something, particularly of the art of construction and building and of mathematics and astronomy. So these people had some basic concept of these things. Now the old peoples, the wise peoples of long ago, have another answer to this problem. Namely, that in a very remote time, say the Hindus, there descended upon this earth the rishis, or the great ones. 
that they were the immortal sages, that they had grown up and become wise and perfect in ages of culture and civilization long before the creation of man, or perhaps even the creation of the solar system, that they were the products of great previous evolutionary cycles, and that they were the ones who placed these first findings at the disposal of man. Therefore, that man did not discover them. He was given them. And that gradually these ancient ones departed and left man to the continuance of the knowledge which they had bestowed. That is an ancient Indian belief, East Indian. There is also the story that the ones responsible for these achievements of man were essentially the lunar ancestors, or the Petris, and that they belong to the previous cycle of life prior to the creation of the earth, which was while the moon was a live world. And that from these distant and remarkable sources this knowledge came. We say this is legend. But we are still confronted with the problem of how were these things discovered. And why is it that with thousands of years of work we have been unable to disprove them with all that we claim to know? And that step by step, as we move forward, we go back to Plato, back to Pythagoras, and back to these ancient calculations. We have our choices. We can psychologically say that these ancient ones, the Rishis and the Sages, represent the potential of our own superconscious. We can say that before man developed his own sensory institution, which we call personal consciousness, while man was still without an objective integration such as we know, that he was still not ignorant, because the preconscious, or that which came before the objectification of his present intellect, contained so much more than his present consciousness is capable of estimating. Man's consciousness, like the little uh, nursery rhyme, sort of came out of the everywhere into the here. And it knew much more when it was everywhere than it does now. Therefore, that man's superconscious or preconscious state was one of extraordinary intuitive awareness. And that the so-called rishis, the ancestors, the ancient teachers, were really his own superconscious parts. And that while he was still without intensive physical integration, these internal resources were available to him. He could consciously know inwardly. Because what the Tibetan calls the eye of the Dhamma had not closed. We had not locked inner vision. Now, assuming psychologically for a moment the possibility of this line of thinking, let's see what has since happened. For the last several thousand years, man has gradually been developing a colossal neurosis. And this neurosis, as anyone realizes who thinks about it, is an abnormal situation arising from false thinking, false standards of value, and misuse of energy. All these things together add up to make the trouble. This neurosis places man under such a pressure of objective intellectualism that he can't even keep quiet. His mind has become a tumbling ground for whimsies. He is full of notions and opinions and very few actual dynamic facts. Let us assume, therefore, that this great objectification of man in which his internal moved outward to meet the pressure of environment has developed a kind of mask, a persona, in which he has built a wall of defense around himself. And behind this wall, he has passed into a state of intensive frustration and neurosis. Thus, by degrees, the very faculties which should have saved him, 
should have assisted him to master the world, have turned upon him and destroyed him by their own false use. As a consequence, he is now restricted almost completely to a traditional descent of knowledge passed on from one person to another, or to a series of scientific discoveries which can never escape the three dimensions. He has lost this power of knowing the ancestor, of communing with the rishis or the saints. He cannot talk with the gods. He is not of that race in which the gods, as mentioned in Genesis, walked in the garden in the cool of the evening. The trouble is, the evening now of a man is not cool. It is a tempestuous world in which subtle things have very little possibility of expression. It might well then be assumed as possible that man, locking himself in an intellectual complex, which is very deep, very sound, very terrible in its implications, has simply locked the inner power to know. Therefore, that he can no longer conceive of how anyone else had it open, or was able to know, but that from man's own preconscious, which is man's link with the universe, man intuitively knew because he was able to name and recognize the facts of things, which we can no longer do. So we have several choices now. Either that man, in his ingenuity, was able to make these objective analogies and disseminate them in one way or another throughout the world, and that man, perhaps, having a kind of mind, not so different from the mind of any other man, that all men might have come to the same conclusions even though they had no contact. And that in a certain degree of the rise of a culture, if people always come to identical, identical findings. This is true in principle, but there is one definite drawback to this particular concept. And that is, that while individuals do come to the same basic ideas, we have another testimony that we can't overlook, and that is that they gave the same names to those ideas. And this brings it a little too close to a coincidence for pleasure. We cannot assume that man, uh, by this method of common uh, learning or common induction, would come to such absolute detailed similarity. You might come to the same general idea but he would clothe it differently. Now, there's another point in connection with that. We know that mythology has been clothed differently because of longitude and latitude, and that peoples with different religions and in different lands and in different distributions of climate have used different symbols for their religions throughout history. Therefore, if they lived as the Nordic people did in a very severe climate, their doctrines took on the severity of that country, whereas those living in tropical or temperate zones had much less stress in their ancient religious symbols and legends. Yet regardless of zone, regardless of climate, regardless of all other factors, the beliefs of these principal cosmological factors were never changed or modified by climate or anything else. Also, there is a very interesting situation in which the astronomical phenomena of the Earth seen from different points differs. And yet, the symbolism which has developed by these different people is the same and does not, has not been deflected by these historical, astronomical, sidereal differences. So we have to go even deeper than this to find the answer. And the only answer that we seem to be able to locate is that man's solar system is a cell, it is a structure, it is a witness to law. That the ancient analogies of the Hermetic doctrine were basically correct. That man can understand the solar system because he is one. 
and that the solar system can be experienced by human consciousness because man's consciousness is a miniature of it. And therefore, that man has within his own awareness that which is analogous to everything outside of himself. Thus, through the study of his own nature, he can come to grasp the laws by means of which universal motions and energies are maintained. Thus, he can experience a structure vaster than himself, because the pattern is identical. The difference is quantitative, but the qualitative factor is the same. And Pythagoras pointed out in his mathematical studies that when quantities differ sufficiently, we suspect the difference of qualities, but this is not true. But that quantitative differences obscure qualitative identities. But actually, qualitative identity always exists. Thus man, by extrasensory perception as we call it today, or by intuitive knowledge, possessed prior to the obscuration of consciousness by sensory development, might have been able to archetypal know all things and name them according to their true natures. Then when he finally went to sleep in objectivity, these subjective things passed backward into a kind of dream state. Then your religious mysteries and your great mystical institutions and your ancient ceremonial rites came into existence, and they were rites of dreams. They were created to artificially force man away from the objective focal awareness to which he had become addicted. The ancient priesthoods worked with trances. They even used narcotic drugs. Uh, as the American Indian mystic did, they used fumigations. And a very common device among ancient people, fasting by means of which the sugar content in the brain was reduced, causing the tendency to psychic phenomena. But all of these things that were done, like the reveries of the psychological analysis, were disciplined efforts set up by religion and philosophy to release the pre-conscious state of man's knowing through initiation through ceremonies and rites, so that man could again attain the availability of the true knowing locked behind false knowing. If such could be conceived to be the case, I think we would then understand this archetypal system and recognize that our so-called astral theology is simply a shorthand system, a system of symbols by means of which the individual, by using symbols for ideas, can mathematically and geometrically restore the basic formulas of existence. And he has warmed these formulas beyond mathematics by bestowing upon them not only number, but moral, emotional, mental, and ethical dimension conveniently doing this by creating divine beings to symbolize number. These beings are gods in the Greek and other pantheons, the great orders of divinities of ancient worship, which are actually symbols of living mathematical focal points, endowed with the qualities of those points as well as the quantity or mathematical distribution of patterns on the basis that the ancients maintained, namely that every mathematical formula was also a moral structure, a living thing, not merely a dead pattern. All this type of thinking might give us a clue to the archetypal astronomy and how it has affected our religions and why it cannot apparently be removed from religion and how religion has continued to build on it even though it has ignored it. 
and continues to preserve it even though it might preach against it. And so denying these things in many instances, religious and philosophical systems continue to use them, never for a moment intending to stop using them. Because the pattern, the, the circumstance, requires this formula, although we do not like to acknowledge where it came from. So out of these considerations, perhaps, we'll get ourselves ready for some more heavy weather next week. Thank <laughs> you.